Good morning. We're going to uh, get started. And I think um, the principles are, are here pretty much. So, uh, so I would like to welcome you to the 18th annual uh, San Jacinto Symposium. And uh, my name is Frank de la Teja. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Texas State Historical Association, the uh, oldest uh, of the and continuously operating learned society in Texas. And um, I would like to begin this morning uh, by uh, thanking the people uh, and organizations that have made today possible. Uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, the San Jacinto uh, Battleground Conservancy, and you'll be hearing a lot more about them uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, but uh, this is a uh, partnership that is uh, new uh, for us with the Conservancy, and we're looking forward to a, to a wonderful uh, relationship. Uh, we also have to thank the uh, Strake Foundation, uh, Humanities Texas, uh, Texas Monthly, the uh, Texas State University Center for the study of the Southwest, uh, the Texas General Land Office, and uh, Mickey and Dr. Ralph uh, Norton. I would also like to thank uh, the staff of the TSHA uh, responsible for the program today, the uh, Charles Nugent, um, our adult education coordinator, uh, Don Arzak, the, uh, our special events coordinator, Steve Cure, our uh, chief operating officer, um, and um, they've, been, they've been up since very early this morning to make sure this program went off. Um, and of course, there's the, uh, the staff here at uh, Studio Grill who have made the uh, facility available to us and a, a great facility and uh, it is, and uh, we hope you will uh, enjoy uh, the lunch today. So uh, we have a few housekeeping things that I need to take care of right now. Um, and first and foremost, of course, is the fact that you are at a studio grill, which means that uh, there's, there's lunch uh, that is provided, and the orders will be taken by the waiting staff during the first break. Uh, if you leave your seat to uh, go to the book exhibit, and we recommend that you go out there and that you patronize our, uh, our various uh, dealers and um, and the State Historical Association table as well, that you, um, when you come back to your seat, the staff will know that they didn't take your order and they will be by to get it. So at some point during the first break, uh, your lunch order will be taken, which means, of course, that you need to come back to the same seat during lunch because that's where lunch will be delivered. Uh, so if you're eating something you didn't order, it's because you sat down at the wrong place. Um, uh, of course, there is the, the restroom uh, and refreshment situation. There are refreshments outside in the hallway, and the, the bathroom or the restroom is uh, down the hall toward the front of the theater. Um, so let me turn for just a second to uh, TSA membership and uh, donations, how you can help the Texas State Historical Association. Um, the TSHA, as we fondly call it, uh, is made up of people from all walks of life with a love for the history uh, of our great state. Uh, although some of us are historians by profession and some by vocation, uh, most members are lovers of Texas history uh, from the general public. Events such as today's, as well as our annual meeting, teacher workshops, webinars, our junior historians and web society programs for students, the Texas History Day uh, for uh, middle and high school students across the state, as well as our scholarly journal, the Southwestern Historical Quarterly, the Handbook of Texas Online, which many of you, are, I'm sure, have already used, uh, the Texas Almanac, um, and our book publications are all made possible in part by membership dues and donations. Consequently, we have a, a special offer for those of you in attendance today either in person um, or uh, viewing this, the live stream. If someone becomes a member today or makes a donation, either online or by phone um, or by turning in the form that was in your goodie bag that you received this morning at registration, you're entered into a drawing 
for the framed map that is displayed at registration, and uh, there's a copy of it. This handsomely framed map uh, will be um, given away at the end of the day uh, based on all of the forms that have been turned in and all of the um, online um, memberships or donations. So um, let me now uh, turn over our um, program for the next few minutes uh, to the San Jacinto Battleground Conservancy, um, which, of course, commemorates the battle uh, that won Texas independence from Mexico. Mr. Jeff Dunn, longtime board member of the Conservancy and one of the avocational historians uh, who formed such a vital part of the TSHA and who has been, uh, is on the board of directors of the Conservancy, uh, will now tell us a bit about their work and about the Battle of San Jacinto. Jeff? Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, as Frank indicated, my name is Jeff Dunn. I'm a co-founder of the San Jacinto Battleground Association, which we also call ourselves the San Jacinto Battleground Conservancy, and a member of the board of directors. Uh, we <clears throat> started this symposium in 2001 as part of the uh, group called the San Jacinto Historical Advisory Board, and uh, our uh, association nonprofit was formed uh, the following year and took over the management of this, and we're very thrilled that uh, we're uh, co-sponsoring this with uh, TSHA this year. Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. So as our name implies, uh, we're focused on the battleground. The, the story of San Jacinto is obviously the story, the narrative of the story, uh, which you read about in the books and the accounts of the survivors. Uh, but there's also the story of the battleground itself. <clears throat> and that's a lot what we focus on. Uh, for the first uh, 15 years of our existence, uh, we were led by Jan DeVault, uh, who uh, worked tirelessly for this organization and for the battleground. Uh, and uh, regrettably, she passed away last year. We're going to have, there, there are some tributes to her in the packet, and there'll be more about her uh, at lunch today. Uh, but really, largely through her leadership, our group is, not only was able to uh, uh, perform and, and put on this symposium year in and year out, but also uh, raise over a million dollars for the battlefield uh, to restore marshes, prairies, uh, boardwalks uh, and, and, and acquire uh, acreage of land out there that was uh, threatened by industrial encroachment. Uh, well, we were also very much involved in the master plan for the park, which aims to help uh, restore and reclaim the, the physical landscape uh, so that uh, visitors can better understand and, and appreciate and interpret the, the battle itself. <clears throat> uh, Cecil Jones is our president now, and he'll be speaking at lunch and telling you a little bit more about our group. But as you can see, this is an early map of Texas, and uh, even at that early stage, San Jacinto Battleground was a landmark in Texas. Uh, it was considered hallowed ground by the Texans. Uh, and today, this is a nice overhead photo. Uh, you can see the boundaries of the uh, park, the state park is in blue, and you can see the uh, extent of uh, industrial encroachment uh, to the north and south and, and west. Uh, our group owns about 32 acres. This is the red uh, rectangle toward the top. And uh, we are uh, working with a very exciting project, which we hope to announce later this year with Texas Parks and Wildlife, dealing with that piece, which is largely between what is now the Battleship Texas and Lynchburg Ferry. So the battle itself, why is this battle significant? Uh, when, when you think about it, it really shouldn't be because the total number of men that were fought there, fought there was only about 2,000, maybe 2,200 or so um, total from both sides. Uh, if this battle had taken place during the Civil War, it probably would not have received anywhere near the, the kind of attention that we pay to it today. So why has this battle become important in Texas history in particular? Uh, one reason is because it really marked a transition, a, pa a passing of sovereignty in Texas. It marked the demarcation between the Spanish and Mexican rule to American and United States control over Texas. 
And also, out of this event and the events that preceded it, there were some fairly compelling uh, narratives and themes. Uh, most important is the uh, relationship between the Alamo, the Battle of the Alamo, and San Jacinto, <clears throat> which uh, we'll be hearing a lot about today. Uh, Holly Breer, in her book, Inherit the Alamo, uh, referred to this as uh, the unified narrative, uh, starting with the sacrificial fall of the Alamo, the death of Texas heroes, uh, followed by uh, the near miraculous victory at San Jacinto. Uh, Alamo and San Jacinto are what she referred to as the inseparable alpha and omega of the Texas creation mythology. And certainly uh, you see that today and you've seen that for decades as part of the whole lore of Texas history. But of course there also is another narrative and the narrative from the Mexican perspective. And that is Mexico viewed this as a tragedy. Uh, not only did they suffer a, a significant humiliating defeat, uh, but they lost a significant amount of territory to the Norte Americanos, who they sort of viewed uh, uh, as ungrateful colonists uh, after Mexico brought them in and tried to nurture them and, and make them part of the Mexican nation. And even more recently, there are other ways to look at this battle and interpret it. Uh, on the side, you look at it from the perspective of Tejanos or African Americans or Indians. Uh, some of these things we've actually explored in our uh, symposiums in previous years. You also have the supporting roles of the convention at Washington on the Brasses and the events with Fannin at Goliad and Coledo Creek. Uh, all this happened within the span of two months, which we now call the high holy days of Texas history uh, because of the uh, significance of all these events. Another very important compelling theme is the Texas equivalent of Lee versus Grant. Uh, we have Sam Houston versus Santa Ana. Houston struggling to keep his volunteer army together and Santa Ana, uh, the uh, trained military expert uh, who uh, was uh, easily uh, conquering everything in his path all the way up until April 21st of 1836. So the physical setting of the battle, uh, of course this is a modern map, uh, largely took place between San Antonio, Houston, and, and what is now Corpus Christi. <clears throat> and Santa Ana, after the Battle of the Alamo, <clears throat> uh, divided his army into three sections and started moving east to try to take, uh, occupy and take control of the rest of the Texas colonies. Only Sam Houston's army and Fannin's army stood in the way. Uh, and almost immediately, uh, Fannin was caught up uh, in a battle with Urea and was uh, surrendered at the Battle of Caledo Creek. And a week later, all of his men were killed at the Goliad mission. And that left Houston's army alone uh, as, uh, in, the, in the path of Santa Ana's uh, advance. And so slowly, the armies kept going. Houston kept advancing east, they call it a retreat. Uh, eventually, they get into uh, what is now Harris County. And although today, of course, Harris County is uh, very populous, in 1836, it actually was very sparsely populated, even for Texas standards. There were only a few settlements and homes in Texas at the time. Uh, Santa Ana entered uh, what is now Harris County from the southwest. He occupied Harrisburg, burned it, moved on to a place called New Washington, and there encountered uh, the natural barrier of the San Jacinto River. Uh, he intended to cross it at Lynchburg Ferry, which is at the confluence of the Buffalo Bayou and San Jacinto River. <clears throat> but in the meantime, Sam Houston's army approached from the Northwest, uh, discovered uh, what Santa Ana was up to, and uh, marched his army to that confluence, to the, the Lynchburg Ferry site in, in an attempt to intercept Santa Ana. And so here we have the two armies facing each other on the morning of April 20th, 1836, uh, with Houston backed up against Buffalo Bayou and Santa Ana coming up from New Washington. And during that day, there was some exchange of cannon fire. There was a skirmish that evening, uh, but uh, Santa Ana retired 
uh, back uh, beyond a, a little rise in the land between the two ar armies and uh, decided he was going to uh, wait for the Texan attack, which he expected to happen on the morning of uh, April 21st. Uh, what happened instead was he received some reinforcements, which gave him a little bit of numerical uh, superiority uh, the next morning, um, and realized the Texans were not going to attack, so he let his men uh, rest for that afternoon. Uh, the Texans, on their part, uh, were expecting Santa Ana to attack them, uh, so uh, they were, uh, and when they realized that wasn't going to happen, uh, they also started resting and, until about the middle of the afternoon on April 21st when uh, they became so frustrated and anxious to get this over with, uh, decisions were made to line up and attack the Mexican camp. And this, so this happened late in the afternoon on April 21st. Uh, this map that we're looking at is from Yoakum's Texas History from 1856. It's a great map. Uh, the Texans attacked the Mexican line. The Mexicans were largely unprepared. Uh, the 18 minutes that you hear about of the battle is the time it took from the first moment of attack until the occupation of the Mexican camp. Uh, after that 18 minutes or 30 minutes or so, uh, there was about a two or three hours of just basically trying to capture and kill Mexican soldiers. It was no longer really a battle. It was a matter of just trying to uh, uh, settle this once and for all, and there was a lot of pent-up anger and frustration on the side of the Texans. And that ended the Battle of San Jacinto. But what made the battle really significant and decisive was what happened the next day when Santa Ana himself was captured uh, a few miles from the battlefield and brought in and surrendered to, to Sam Houston, as, as depicted in this uh, iconic scene from uh, Huddle's painting. It was really that event, the, the fact that the president, the, the titled president of Mexico and this well-known military figure was actually captured uh, as a prisoner. And that led to uh, the retreat of the Mexican army. And at the end of the day, the, you know, the, the, the final uh, Republic of Texas uh, was born. So that's the general story. There's a lot more to it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very compelling uh, narrative of, of uh, how all this unfolded. And of course, during the 20th century, a lot of this was put to film. Uh, and that's what we're going to hear about today. And with that, I'd like to thank you and welcome you to our 2018 symposium. Well, thank you, Jeff. And um, the um, thing that I forgot to remind you about is please take a second right now to turn off or silence your cell phones. Very important. Happens at church. They tell us every, every Sunday morning, silence or, or turn off your cell phones. And eventually, one goes off right in the middle of of the celebration. So uh, please take care of that and um, help the people around you better enjoy the program. Your moderator today um, is Dr. James Crisp, another longtime member of the association with a particular interest in the Texas Revolution. He is the author of, among other things, the award-winning Sleuthing the Alamo, Davy Crockett's Last Stand, and Other Mysteries of the Texas Revolution. Uh, Dr. Crisp has been involved with the San Jacinto Symposium uh, since the beginning, uh, taking over as moderator in 2003, uh, making this his uh, 16th campaign in that capacity. And uh, he is going to take over the program now, and I will retire until lunchtime. So I leave it in the very capable hands of Jim Crisp. Jim? Thanks very much, Frank. Um, reading glasses are something I've developed since that first San Jacinto Symposium, so you'll have to pardon those. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to be introducing Frank Thompson, who, like myself, was one of the speakers at the very first San Jacinto Symposium in 2001. Um, the second year was <clears throat> a little strange for me. I wasn't a speaker. I wasn't a moderator. Uh, I was a heckler. Uh, in the audience asking embarrassing questions. 
Um, and then, uh, in order to control me for the next 16 years, uh, they made me the moderator for life. Um, I don't usually correct Jeff Dunn, but I'm going to correct him now. All of Fannin's men weren't killed uh, in the massacre or in the Battle of Coleto. 28 of those men who were taken out to be shot survived. Uh, and one of them I've been working on now for 25 plus years, Hermann Ehrenberg. And you'll hear, I hope, in San Jacinto Symposia of the Future, a little bit more about him. Um, I'm going to be introducing three people this morning, uh, Frank Thompson, Steve Harrigan, and Paul Andrew Hutton. Um, Sir Isaiah Berlin once said that there are two kinds of thinkers, uh, the hedgehog and the fox. And the fox knows uh, something about almost everything. And that's what these three guys are. They know something about almost everything. I'm a hedgehog. I just sort of burrow in on the Texas Revolution and find that there are still amazing things to discover here more than 175, 180 years after the Texas Revolution. Documents are coming to light. Even photographs of principles are coming to light uh, in the last two years. So we're not just doing old stuff when we do this kind of history. We're doing new stuff too, new stuff that informs us about what happened in the past. Frank Thompson has told me that this new book of his, Nothing Sacred, the Cinema of William Wellman, is either his 43rd or 44th book. I just assume that Frank is slipping into dementia because he can't figure out which one it is. Uh, but Frank is, Frank is in many ways the hardest working man in show business. Um, he was in television for more than 20 years writing ridiculous scripts and trying to make sense out of people's cultural lives. Um, his, he's done five books on the Alamo. Uh, started very much putting my poor uh, efforts in the shade, uh, including a novel uh, based on the story of the Alamo in which he's put the names of many of his friends, myself included. I find this to be a remarkable honor um, to find myself slipped in as a kind of ne'er-do-well in the middle of a movie about, uh, in the middle of a novel about the Alamo. Um, Frank and myself and six other historians and writers, along with Michael Kornblith, that I'll, I'll be introducing later, uh, met with Ron Howard in May of 2002, I believe it was, uh, at the Doubletree Hotel. Um, I'm going to start telling secrets. All of us had to sign a non-disclosure contract that was clearly written by a Hollywood lawyer we weren't supposed to say anything about that meeting for the rest of time in any form whatsoever, anywhere in the known universe. There might have been a phrase in there about the unknown universes there too. But uh, that, uh, uh, including Michael, seven of the dozen people who were there that evening are here today because we're doing the Texas Revolution in the movies. Uh, and there are so many challenges to try to do history in film. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who wrote The Handmaid's Tale and won a Pulitzer Prize for it, said the most frightening thing she ever did was to work on the public television adaptation of that book. Because when you're writing, you can hide stuff. You can just not mention things. You don't say what the room has to look like. But when you're putting it on TV or putting it in a film, you have people like Michael Korenblith trying to think about everything that's in the frame and making sure that what's in the frame, if you're doing it right, 
is authentic, as authentic as you can possibly make it. And that can be a very challenging and frightening, but also a very rewarding thing. Because the world out there needs to be entertained and educated at the same time. If you try to do just one of those things, um, you're either wasting your time or theirs. But if you try to educate and entertain at the same time, to keep the attention, to challenge the imagination, and at the same time to educate about the past and therefore what the present is like, because the present is based on that past, whether we know it or not, then you've really accomplished something. And all of the people that we'll be talking about, that we'll be talking to you today, have been engaged in that kind of combination of education and entertainment. I love talking to Frank. I love listening to Frank. And so I want you to listen to Frank Thompson and hear what he has to say about putting the San Jacinto battle on film. Frank Thompson. Yeah, keep the applause going until I get to the podium. I was, I was, uh, sit down, sit down. I want to, uh, I, uh, Jim's very kind introduction reminded me of two anecdotes from my life, one very recent, one from the distant dark past. Um, the first one is, I just completed this mammoth book on director William Wellman, and he directed Wings, The Public Enemy, Bojess, Star is Born, Nothing Sacred, The High and the Mighty, many, many more films. And uh, this book I've done is uh, bigger than a car. And um, I was doing my taxes recently, and the tax guy, who was in his 40s, I mean, he wasn't a kid, uh, asked me who Wellman was, and I was telling him, and I said, among the films he directed was The Public Enemy with James Cagney. And he said, oh, like uh, Cagney and Lacey? <laughs> when I was working in TV uh, for my sins, I worked on a show called uh, Blind Date, and you probably don't remember it because it has been gone a long time. But it was basically a comedy show, but they would send people out on blind dates and then make fun of them. They would give them thought bubbles and uh, stuff like that. And I was writing the host scripts. And um, we had one date where the guy was British and the, and the girl was American. And they hated each other right off the bat. And so throughout the day, there were little art cartoon red coats shooting at little cartoon blue coats and so forth. And so when I was writing the host script, I wrote, uh, boy, that date had plenty of spirit. Unfortunately, it was the spirit of 76. <laughs> and we were in a meeting with the producers, and one of the executives said to me, Frank, most of our audience wasn't even born in 76. <laughs> As Jim said, I've been writing, a, I wrote a lot of books about the Alamo, and almost all of them had to do with the cultural side. In fact, one of them is called the Alamo Cultural History, and one is called Alamo Movies. So uh, I'm not a real historian like all the other speakers you're going to see today. I'm just a movie historian, uh, and so I'm humbled and embarrassed to be included among these greats uh, that will follow me. Uh, but I will try to speak in coherent English regardless. Um, every movie about the past is really a movie about the present. Uh, nobody, no matter how hard they try, can really make a depiction of the past that is not colored in some way by the way things are now. Um, when it comes to the Battle of San Jacinto, it's um, a gradual thing because how do you look at the battle? The battle itself is a historic fact and actually better than the Alamo, we know 
a lot more specifically about the Battle of San Jacinto simply because there were more people around to tell about it. Uh, the Alamo, you have to fill in a lot of, a lot of uh, gaps with suppositions. Um, but although it's, a, it's an established factual event, how we look at it changes from time to time and over the years. The first films about this battle almost all came within uh, a movie about the Alamo, in fact. Now, I, I must say, it, it's an idiot or a fool who calls anything the first anything because somebody can prove you wrong. That being said, the first movie about the Alamo was The Immortal Alamo, a picture uh, you see up there. And um, it was a one reel film, so it, it covered a lot in probably 16, 17 minutes. Um, 1911, that was about state of the art. And um, they concentrated on the Dickinsons, uh, Lieutenant Dickinson and his wife, Lucy. Um, and uh, there is a, a Mexican spy played by Francis Ford, the older brother of director John Ford. And he is able to come and go into the Alamo. And uh, so he makes a deal with Santana, as you would if you're a spy. He said, I'll tell you all about what the defenses are like in there and tell you when is the best time to strike. But I want Lucy Dickinson uh, for myself as a reward. Now, who among us hasn't said something similar in our lives? Um, so Santana says, well, that's a good deal. I, I like that a lot. So he does. They attack the Alamo. They kill everybody. And uh, Navarre, the Francis Ford character, is uh, at Santana's camp uh, getting started on a forced marriage. And... For a scoundrel, come on, he marries her first. So it's, uh, and uh, actually the owner of the company, Gaston Melies, the brother of Georges Melies, uh, plays the padre who is marrying them. But just before I do can be said, um, the vengeful army of Sam Houston rushes into the camp and defeats everybody. And as you can see, Lieutenant Dickinson uh, takes care of Navarre all by his own self. Uh, that's Francis Ford right there, uh, breathing his last. And the great Edith story is Lucy Dickinson, uh, really one of the remarkable and, and under-recognized uh, actors of the early movies. Um, the, let me make sure I know how to do this right. Look at that. No, that was this, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's really a, amazing how, how much that, Huddle painting has informed uh, cinematic depictions because something like this shows up in virtually every movie about San Jacinto. And uh, unfortunately, we have no idea who played Sam Houston in this film. Um, we, uh, the credits weren't normally uh, shared with the public in 1911. Uh, it was either considered that they didn't think the audience would be that interested or that uh, they didn't want actors getting a big head and, and wanting more money. Uh, probably the latter is truer, uh, but interestingly, on the film itself, credits were listed and it was novel enough that several of the uh, trade papers of the time mentioned it, that uh, the cast was given uh, at the end of the film. And uh, that was rare. So if we could find the film, we could find who played Sam Houston. But we can't, so we don't, and we haven't. Um, the first existing Battle of San Jacinto, also from an Alamo movie called Martyrs of the Alamo. And um, I want to show you this battle because it's brief and it's uh, public domain. Um, this one also, like this, is, is more like a, uh, a gradual infiltration than, than a frontal attack. Um, the <laughs> one of the main characters in Martyrs of the Alamo is the famous historical figure Silent Smith. And um, he, um, 
he is captured uh, by Santana, but is so convinced, he's, he so convincingly plays a deaf person that Santana feels that he's harmless to have around the camp. And um, it's, I didn't include it in this because it's a little bit after the battle, but uh, when Santana uh, finds out that after the battle and after he's been captured that Silent Smith can actually hear, the look of hurt on his face is really touching. He's like, I talked in front of you and told you all my plans, and I thought you couldn't hear a word I said. Um, it's also the first film that we know, I mean, we don't know what the Immortal Alamo was like, so. Um, but in this one, um, Santana is described by a, a title card as an inveterate drug fiend, uh, notorious for his uh, orgies. And um, the orgy depicted in the film is really not uh, worthy of the name, but um, it is the first, uh, the first time that we see what is a movie makers can't get enough of, which is the Emily Morgan legacy. Um, and I'll jump ahead a little bit. Last, when I spoke here at the first one in 2001, I showed a montage of clips and, and got light wrist slaps from uh, some people afterwards because there was a TV miniseries called um, James A. Michener's Texas. And uh, boy, what garbage it was. And, uh, but the notable thing about James A. Mitchell's Texas was that it contains what I consider to be the most gratuitous nudity of any film I've ever seen. Uh, women with no shirts on will simply walk into a scene and stand there for a minute and then walk away. And the only time it kind of makes sense, and yet not, is during the Battle of San Jacinto. We know that uh, Santa Ana is uh, tucked away in his tent uh, with a lovely woman. And right in the middle of the battle, she steps out of the tent, just like God made her, and looks around for a little bit and goes back into the tent and uh, apparently gets dressed. I don't know. But uh, the, what, they, what they did for that film is, uh, was a weird thing. They released it on video first in an uncut version, and then it was syndicated on television about a month later with obviously all the uh, gratuitous nudity taken out. So um, you will not see that scene today because I was uh, chastised for letting it show. <laughs> but the, uh, I will show you the uh, Immortal Alamo San Jacinto scene. I mean, excuse me, the Martyrs of the Alamo. Because it's, um, uh, it is the way they saw it at the time. And, um, you know, it was, it was produced by D.W. Griffith. It was the same year as Birth of a Nation. And unfortunately, has pretty much the same racial politics uh, toward Mexicans as Birth of a Nation did toward African Americans. And so it's not, a, it's not a very fun picture to see in that respect. But um, let's... Uh, yeah, how do, how do I start this? I know how to get to the <laughs> thing, but I don't know if there's a... Uh... Can you start the clip? No, go back. Yeah, oh, there we go. There's a play button. Oh, okay. Well, there was music on it too, but... Uh, Hey, the orgy. There you go. So as you can see, this is very much a surreptitious um, attack, not a, not a big one like uh, subsequent ones had. There we go. And he's stoned out of his gourd. Yep. Of 
Poor guy just wants a peek instead. Gets a bonk on the head. If, uh, if that looks silly to you, and um, I judge from the laughter that it does, um, may I point you toward, Houston, uh, toward Texas rising? And, um, <laughs> and I think this will suddenly seem to be a model of historical authenticity. <laughs> Now this is a frustrating film because it's lost. This is uh, William Farnham. His brother, Dustin Farnham, had played Davy Crockett the year before. And this was a genuinely epic telling of the life of Sam Houston. Uh, made in 1917, uh, according to all the trade papers, there were 8,000 extras. They filmed it in California, in Texas, but never specifically said where in Texas, and in Mexico. And it climaxes with a huge battle against the Mexican army, and it's not the Battle of San Jacinto. Um, it's uh, Sam Houston leads uh, his uh, faithful Comanche uh, warriors in defeating uh, the Mexican troops. And it's... Uh, the whole movie ends before the Texas Revolution. So even if we got it, it's not, <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be thinking, what? Why, why don't you do that? But um, this is, very few pictures survive from this film that I've ever, I've looked for years. And uh, this was from a magazine article and it gives you a few. But boy, it looks like they're getting ready to do San Jacinto up, up in the top there, but they're not. Anyway. Um, that was Houston's first real portrayal on film. Um, the next one came in 1939, uh, Richard Dix as Houston in Man of Conquest. And I like this picture a lot. It, um, it covers the Alamo pretty well. That actually, you know, one of the great things about the Alamo in, in, is... Now it's got what we call the hump, and you know what uh, they, they often refer to as the bed stand top. With, but uh, of course, the real one did not. It was had just a flat uh, roof line, and uh, this one is so clever, I think, because it starts off with uh, a model. It's actually a model, but a very beautiful one, and it starts off with the church has with a hump, and during the cannonade. They keep blowing it down until at the end it's like, uh, like you would see it in the Everett drawing. So it's, uh, I thought it was a clever way of, of making people understand something that's not quite true, but points towards something that's true. Um, but here is the Battle of San Jacinto getting ready to start. And uh, you got to wonder what they thought they were doing with all the wagons. Because when, <laughs> when the attack actually starts, those wagons are heading right toward the Mexican lines. And uh, to what end? I don't know. 
But uh, this is a good one. Unfortunately, this shows uh, one reason that many movies of this era make me very uncomfortable, and that's a, a technique called the running W that uh, stunts did for horse falls, which is, as I'm sure most of you know, a technique by which you, the rider puts wires around the front legs, or the front ankles of the horse, and when it's time to, to uh, fall, you simply jerk them up, the horse comes down like that. And uh, there's some movies like The Charge of the Light Brigade that I literally can't watch. I just can't because those horses are being hurt and killed and there's no other way around it. But this is a, uh, this is perhaps the last time that the Battle of San Jacinto is seen as a purely righteous act of vengeance um, where the Texas army is thoroughly in the right and the Mexican army is nothing but wrong having massacred everybody at the Alamo. Um, this is a, uh, a point that historically you can debate all day long, or and we've lived for since 2001, they've done it here. But um, whether you look at it from one side of the battle or from both sides of the battle, and as time went on, it became more and more the case that they would take a look at both sides so that... Uh, without letting it, it go one way or the other, showing both sides of the argument. This one is uh, still pretty much in the righteous uh, justice part. It's Joel McRae as Sam Houston. Also not a bad movie. It's, uh, it's shot in Cinemascope, so it's got a real sense of epic splendor. And uh, I like Joel McRae, uh, but it's not anything that you would call very accurate. Um, but that is not really the point, which we will talk to a little bit later. And here's what I call the blank screen that, uh, <laughs> there we go. So other uh, Houstons have been um, put in films that are much more ambiguous about the right and wrong uh, uh, aspect of this film. This is obviously Dennis Quaid from the Alamo, 2004. Uh, the only one who wears the tricorn hat, as seen in that famous uh, painting of Houston, uh, did he really wear one? I don't know, we have a painting in which he did, so there you go. That one is from Houston, The Legend of Texas. And here is a, let me, yeah, let's see where we are here. No, I'm trying to get past it. Um, hmm. Bear with me, folks. I've just lost everything. Okay, I'm going to have to go all the way through, right? I'm just going for the last clip. Okay. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take a look at that. Um, starting in the 50s, there, as I said, there became more of a willingness to show the movie, show the conflict from both sides. Um, in the last, com the last Command, which does not show San Jacinto, but ends at the fall of the Alamo, um, Jim Bowie, the lead character, is shown as being a good friend of Santana. And they have many scenes together, first very cordial and very, very uh, familial scenes, and then as it becomes clear that they can't come to terms in their own viewpoints, they split and 
Santana attacks the Alamo and, and kills him. John Wayne um, also did the same thing. He wanted to make sure in his film that the Mexican army was not vilified in any way, that this was not seen as um, uh, a race war, as m many of the earlier films did. And on several occasions gives his characters lines that talk about the bravery of the Mexican army um, and how good they are and how much they believe in what they're doing. And at the end, when Mrs. Dickinson is walking out with the two children and uh, Santana is there and he doffs his hat and he orders everyone to stand, to stand up while she passes as a very gallant gesture. Um, now, John Wayne planned to make a sequel to the Alamo, which was about Sam Houston and the Battle of San Jacinto. And confusingly, he was going to play Sam Houston after having played <laughs> Davy Crockett in the Alamo. Uh, this was announced widely in the trade papers in 1960 and 61 that this was going to be the next big project for Wayne. But uh, to my knowledge, it never even got to uh, a treatment or a script or anything. Um, would have been interesting to see what he would have done with that. And frankly, I think he would have been a better Sam Houston than he was a Davy Crockett, although I think he's a good Davy Crockett. I like it. I like that movie. Um, after that, um, and most notably in the 2004 The Alamo, um, the Mexican side is depicted uh, in, in some depth and um, the ideas and the reasons and the impetus behind what the Mexican army is up to is very well delineated, I think. Um, it's my opinion, you know, the film did not do well at the box office and I'm sorry about that because I like the film a lot, but it's my humble opinion, in case anybody ever asked me, and nobody ever has, that um, that, that very even-handedness worked against it because movies really work best when there's a good guy and a bad guy. And I often think that that might be part of it because people felt like it was a balanced view and these guys had a point and these guys had a point and they just couldn't get together on it and it ended in violence and death. Um, I'm going to show you what I believe. Is that clip uh, available? Yeah. Start that. <laughs> start that, and let me think. Let me see if it is what I think it is. Okay. That's just a still, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go to the next one. Oh, without, yeah. This is from Houston, Legend of Texas. There you go. And the next one, oh, I think I'm missing a clip, so please forgive me because I think I've, uh, <laughs> there was a certain amount of uh, to and fro on these clips. Um, the Eagle was used in a couple of films. Uh, Stacy Keach also gets just to the beginning of the fight and looks up and sees an eagle flying above. Uh, Richard Boone as Sam Houston in John Wayne's The Alamo uh, goes it even better. He has a, an eagle, or excuse me, a raven uh, on the back of his, uh, his coat. It's embroidered on the back of his coat. Um, 
the whole the whole point of accuracy, historical accuracy, is the big bugbear when you're talking about these films, because there are people who can't get past historical inaccuracies. Well, if you can't, then you may as well not watch movies, because it's impossible for a movie to be totally historically accurate. Maybe, well, let's see. And um, all you can do is hope that a film takes history seriously because you have to conflate events, you have to invent dialogue. What do people talk about in the Alamo? We have very little actual hard evidence and nothing that you could take into a court of law. So you have to invent everything and you have to invent it with a certain amount of logic. And if you try to do everything as correctly as possible, then it's gonna be fairly accurate. But uh, that's really a different thing because movies are not history lessons and can't work that way. What they can do is like the ballads of old, they can inspire, they can uh, teach people about characters and about events you know, in the broadest sense. But when it comes down to details, there's always going to be some kind of objection from somebody. I was just telling somebody today, it's my, it's my feeling that when it comes to history, the great majority of people know one thing about any given event. And if you project that one thing differently in a movie than the way they think it is, then they'll hate the movie. And in the Alamo, you got people who, you know, there are people who think nothing about anything except the epaulets on the Mexican uniforms or uh, the bullseyes on the top of the shakos, and they obsess on that, and they don't really, they let everything else <laughs> pretty much slide. Um, some years ago, there was a lost, when I wrote my book, Alamo Movies, it was a lost film um, called The Alamo Shrine of Texas Liberty, and it was made in 1938, and it, it was the cheapest uh, show that you can imagine. It was uh, the Mexicans are basically wearing paper hats. Um, they hired extras from the unemployment office, and when it shows the Texans walking or walking into the gates, they actually filmed at San Jose uh, Mission. They show them walking through the gates. They're in short sleeves and slacks. And um, so throughout the film, uh, it was made for a buck and a half by this guy who just, you know, uh, came down and tried his best and he did what he could and so it was found and we were watching it uh, my friend Murray Weissman in New Jersey found a 16 millimeter print so a bunch of us were there watching it and we get through all of this stuff I remind you paper hats and we get to <laughs> one of the battle scenes and one of the guys in the room said <laughs> look at those guns uh, <laughs> so <laughs> So, uh, I, I have a feeling that every time we, we see a movie about the Alamo or the Battle of San Jacinto, there is somebody in the audience just going, can you believe that saddle on that horse? And because that's what he knows and that's what he cares about. Um, in the final analysis, the best we could hope for from a historical film is inspiration to learn more, to go on. Uh, I was a child when John Wayne's Alamo was released. I was a little too young for the Davy Crockett craze, but I caught up on it uh, on the other side of John Wayne's film. And um, it inspired me. They both inspired me. And there's nothing factual in either one of those films. And I mean nothing. Um, and what did I care? Because I then read Walter Lord and I just kept reading and and finally read things that were much closer to the truth. And I think that's what movies do. They entertain first, and that's always the first obligation of a feature film, is to entertain. And the second thing is to inspire. And sometimes there will be something in there that, uh, that is true and can amaze you with, wow, did that really happen? And uh, in some cases, it did. Now, does anybody have any questions for me? And I can I make up an answer to anything.
Yes. Uh, trying to the last movie on the chief. What was the name of the guy? I'm trying to get down this name and keep the word positive. The one I was just talking about with the with the bad guns, uh, the Alamo Shrine of Texas Liberty. Yeah, um, we released a set of uh, let's let's either say classic or public domain, so they're cheap films on the Alamo, and that was among them. Uh, just um, you can probably still find it on eBay. There's like a three disc set. The Alamo Shrine of Texas Liberty. Anybody else? The Alamo Shrine of Texas Liberty. Anybody? Yes. Um, that shift you talked about for the ethical treatment between Mexican and Texans is happening around World War II. Do you think this is being driven by like American society or is it just happening in Hollywood? And Hollywood saying like this is a, an evidence of Hollywood kind of maturing and storytelling. <laughs> Um, well, I will say this about Hollywood is that they don't want to alienate any audience. And so that has got to be part of it, that they would think, well, there's no reason for everybody in Mexico to avoid seeing our film because we've done something terrible. So that's part of it. Um, and I think just a general broadening of, of our sense of, of history and how things work and uh, our gradual uh, realization that we live in a world of many people and that uh, everybody has a point of view. As uh, Jean Renoir says in uh, Rules of the Game, uh, the terrible thing is that everyone has his reasons. And I think it's part of that. But now, um, I mean, certainly since the 80s, when uh, the Tejano uh, Defenders of the Alamo started becoming more popularly known in the in the broader culture, and all those stories started emerging. Um, people started looking into the African American people who were inside the Alamo, and that remains uh, uh, something to be explored because a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about who was there. But I think we just now live in a world where we can't, with very few exceptions, I mean, Nazis are still pretty fair game for being the bad guys. We, uh, we're, we're not gonna be too fair with them at, at any point in the future, I hope. Um, but I think it's just a broadening of uh, cultural awareness and perhaps sensitivity. Uh, some people will say political, political correctness, but I don't think that's the case. I think that's an insulting way to look at a way to try to understand varying points of view. Yes? Have you looked at the other side of the, uh, of the, of the war, the battle, the revolution, on the Mexican side as far as filmmaking? Are there any, any myth? I have never seen a Mexican-made film about this period. There might be one, but I've never found one or seen one. Um, Is there any cases that came from Europe or anything? Not that I've ever seen. No. There's a spaghetti western called uh, Def Smith and Johnny Ears. And uh, I eagerly looked at that, and of course it has nothing to do with anything. It's just just characters' names. Um, and um, there are a couple of spaghetti westerns that, like, there's one called, I think, Road to the Alamo or, or something like that, but it has nothing to do with the Alamo at all. Not even set in, in that period. I don't know. Um, I've always been curious why the Mexican film industry never saw anything interesting in that period to, to do, because I would be fascinated to, to see what came up. Yes? Uh, could you go a, into a little bit more detail regarding the distinction between, say, Martyrs of the Alamo and Hancock's Alamo in 2004, both take us out of, they're both named or have in the name Alamo. Yeah. They take us to San Jacinto. Well, John Wayne just they, the, the survivors ride off into the sunset, right? So yeah. it's odd since they are headed east. 
But, any <laughs> but are they? Um, <laughs> oh, he wants to talk about uh, the fact that some Alamo films go on to San Jacinto and some just end at the, at the Battle of the Alamo. Um, there are several. There's a 1926 film called With Davy Crockett at the Fall of the Alamo, and that's exactly what it is. It, when the Alamo falls, the movie's over. Um, the Last Command from 1955 was a Republic picture, and that's where John Wayne tried for years to make the Alamo, and uh, eventually quit the studio and moved on and formed his own company uh, to make the film, which he finally got around to in 1959. Um, I believe that John Wayne's film, the script from that film, was co-opted by Republic because it was already there and they changed it a little bit. They made uh, Jim Bowie the main character instead of Davy Crockett. And there's a lot of similarities between those two movies, a lot. Um, even lines that are very similar. And um, so both of those end at the, at the battle. And neither one of them talks about uh, revenge to come or a, another event to come. It's simply, uh, as the song goes in the Alamo, they fought to give us freedom. That is all we need to know. And uh, maybe we need to know more. Who knows? Um, it's interesting to me uh, that uh, because, it's seen, because the Alamo is only half the story because without San Jacinto, the sacrifice at the Alamo doesn't have any weight. It doesn't make any sense. It's just a bunch of guys who fought a battle and lost the end. What kind of story is that? The Battle of San Jacinto gives it purpose. And um, the closest we get in, in a strictly Alamo film is a 1938 film called uh, he Heroes of the Alamo. And um, at the end, Mrs. Dickinson is brought before Sam Houston. And um, she says, in essence, you know, Mr. Houston, you've got to you've got to remember what they did. You've got to remember the Alamo, and he stands up in a very stalwart way. And so, at least that way, we get a little sense that uh, something is going on. But I I present to you that I think in 1937 and 38, uh, more people knew generally what the history of their country was than <laughs> many people do now. Um, so you could do that. You could do a kind of uh, throwaway thing like that, and people would say, yeah, I know, it's the uh, it Battle of San Jacinto is coming up. So, one more, yes. Are you aware of any upcoming Alamo, Simpsono film projects in the works, planning stages, anything like that? No, I think uh, Texas Rising has, uh, has, <laughs> has closed the book. On, uh, at least I hope it has. Uh, Still like to see one, but we have the 2004. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take one. Yes. Uh, yes. I think it was mentioned earlier that you have a new book, and it's called Nothing to Safe. Yeah, but you can't get it. That's a long story. Meet me after the thing, and I'll tell you about it. It's uh, Nothing Sacred, the Cinema of William Wellman. Is it published yet? Yes. It's already published, and it can't be bought anymore. It's a long, as I say, a long story. Uh, they won't be off. What? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say uh, it's nice to see you back. <laughs> Why, thank you, Tony. Thanks, Thanks a lot. I'm reminded of one more thing that Holly Beachley Breer, the anthropologist uh, who wrote about the Alamo, said about the period from early March until April 21st. She refers to it as Texas Lent, uh, <laughs> from the sacrifice to the resurrection. Uh, and that's uh, where the idea of high holy days uh, come in. Um, I want to also mention uh, one brief plug after doing my Herman Ehrenberg bit. Uh, there is a book coming out uh, of perhaps general in interest to this audience towards the end of this year, maybe January, possibly as early as December, 
that the LSU Press and I think the University of Georgia Press are putting together uh, called Writing History with Lightning. Anyone recognize that quotation, Writing History with Lightning? It's from Woodrow Wilson when he saw Birth of a Nation in the White House in 1915. And this new book is called Writing History with Lightning and uh, 20 or so historians, including myself, have done essays on how movies treat America in the 19th century. And there are lots and lots of issues that were mentioned by Frank that will be mentioned by others that also come to fruition in that uh, particular book. Uh, I just mentioned one for it by way of example, and that's John David Smith, who is an expert on the Civil War and African American history, has done the movie Glory for that. Mine are the two Alamo movies with Billy Bob Thornton and John Wayne playing Davy Crockett, excuse me, Davy Crockett in 1960 and 2004. Um, because we're running a little ahead of time, We've got 15 minutes before I'm going to introduce Steve Harrigan. And so my masters and bosses have suggested that we take a 15 minute break. But that means only 15 minutes. So if you'd like a break now to return your coffee to the great web of life, uh, <laughs> you have that much time. Thank you. I first met Steve Harrigan in Steve Harden's living room uh, in Pflugerville, Texas. Steve Harrigan wasn't there. I was watching the new uh, History Channel special on the Alamo that they had finished in the mid-1990s. Um, I, I don't think I knew what Stephen Harrigan looked like before then. But that night at a outdoor Mexican restaurant in Austin, I saw him walk by, and I said, excuse me, aren't you Steve Harrigan? And because he had been at a TSHA meeting that afternoon, he said, yes, aren't you Jim Crisp? And <laughs> which really impressed me a lot. And uh, I, I, I'm proud to call him a friend ever since, and I cashed in on that friendship when he sent me an early copy uh, of Gates of the Alamo. And I can't think offhand of a better example of combining education and entertainment uh, than Steve Harrigan's Gates of the Alamo. Um, like many writers, he invents some fictional characters. I don't get to do that. I, I can't tell you what the frustrations are not to be able to make stuff up. Uh, but there's a, there's, there's a method in that madness and, and, and in that creation of fictional characters. And uh, as we were suggesting in the previous section, Steve is paying as much attention to the Mexican side months and months before the coming of the te Texas Revolution as well as the Texas and American side, and I must say that it's not just, again, I'm going to have to correct Jeff Dunn. I really like correcting Jeff Dunn. <laughs> and that is that there was much more to the Texas Republic than the United States. Now, we've shown in several San Jacinto symposia just how important the United States was uh, uh, in the Texas Revolution, and just how much truth there was in the Mexican accusation that this was a land grab on the part of the United States. If you take a look, for instance, at Ed Miller's book on New Orleans and the Texas Revolution, you'll see that there were guys in New Orleans pulling strings that directed that revolution more than many people on site. But what, what Harrigan does with these fictional characters is to make you care and make you wonder what's going to happen to these people in a battle that you already know is going to be lost. Um, 
And yet, because you don't know what's going to happen to his characters, because he has the luxury of making things up about them, um, you, you really do care about these people on both sides of the, of the, of the fight, and you really do wonder what's going to happen to them. Uh, Steve has won more awards than I'd like to mention from more places than I'd like to mention because I'm envious. Um, he's now working on a movie with Elizabeth Crook based on her relatively new book, The Witch Way Tree. Uh, Steve Harden, who you'll meet later today, told me that he stayed up half the night reading the first quarter or so of The Witch Way Tree uh, by Elizabeth Crook. Um, Steve is also working on a narrative history of Texas. He tells me he doesn't have a title yet. He hasn't told me whether he's making stuff up in the narrative history of Texas. But we all have to just sort of nudge a little bit towards the direction of fiction, even if we don't quite get there, because we have to fill in so many gaps. The historical record is fragmented, contradictory. I was just talking to Rich Carrilla from Bracketville about the different versions we have from eyewitnesses of what happened, say, in the storming of Bayer or the storming of San Antonio in 1835. Um, and I've just been reading the memoirs of Reuben Brown, who was one of the prisoners of Matamoros uh, in the aftermath of the Texas Revolution. Reuben Brown gave three different versions of what had happened to James Grant and the other people who found themselves up against the Mexican army when they least expected it. So even the eyewitnesses can contradict themselves. Um, Steve Harrigan uh, is going to talk to us about how he approaches this dilemma of fictionalizing history, both <laughs> the good and the bad. And now let Steve tell you which he thinks is which. Please welcome Steve Harrigan. Thank you, Jim, very much. Uh, and. Uh, Boy, if anybody has a good title for a book about the history of Texas, could you come please see me later? I'm, I'm desperate, I'm almost through with this book. Uh, you might be wondering why the great uh, novelist, author of Portrait of a Lady and Wings of a Dove, Henry James, is on the screen when we're talking about San Jacinto. Uh, he's there because uh, I'm so glad when I started writing The Gates of the Alamo around 1992, that I hadn't encountered his opinion of historical fiction. He, uh, he I probably wouldn't have been able to start. It, it, his, his ideas were so intimidating. He wrote to a woman named Sarah Orne Jewett, a friend of his in 1901, who was working on a novel about the Revolutionary War, and he tried to stop her. He, he wrote to her and said, the historic novel is, for me, condemned to a fatal cheapness. It, it was, this was a judgment that was echoed a century or so later by the New Yorker book critic James Wood, who called historical fiction a somewhat Jim Crack genre, not exactly jammed with greatness. And for Henry James, the objection was more philosophical than that. Here's what else he wrote to, to Sarah Orne Jewett. You may multiply the little facts that can be got from pictures and documents, relics and prints, as much as you like. The real thing is almost impossible to do. I mean the invention, the representation of the old consciousness. Of course, one of the people who ignored Henry James's advice, along with Shakespeare and Dickens and Tolstoy, was uh, is Hilary Mantel. Uh, let's see which way this goes. I, need, I might need a two. Yeah, there she is. Hilary Mantel, who wrote uh, Wolf Hall and also the, its uh, sequel, Bring Up the Bodies, and there's going to be a trilogy of, of novels about the court of Henry VIII, to me, uh, does a better job 
of immersing readers in the sights and smells and textures of the past better than anyone else I've ever read. But she herself knows her limitations, and she knows that her limitations as a novelist begin with the limitations of history itself. History, she writes, is what's left in the sieve when the centuries have run through it. A few stones, scraps of writing, scraps of cloth. It is no more the past than a birth certificate is a birth, or a script is a performance, or a map is a journey. It is no more than the best we can do. Now, when it comes to fictional depictions of the Texas Revolution, I, I would guess that probably everyone in this room would agree that the best we can do should be the least that all novelists and filmmakers should strive for. I'm, I'm not opposed to having fun with history. Uh, a few years ago, I, I published a novel called uh, A Friend of Mr. Lincoln. And when I was uh, working on this book, doing a lot of research, it's about Abraham Lincoln's life, early life in Springfield, Illinois, during the 1830s and 1840s, when he was a lawyer and state legislator. And I did my usual obsessive thing. I went to uh, Springfield and talked to the people at the, uh, at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And I was so nervous that I wouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, you know, it, I, I'm in awe of the historians in this room. I'm in awe of the historians that I was talking to in Springfield. And one day I was there in the library talking to people, asking questions, and they said, uh, sorry, we gotta go. And I said, where, where are you going? They said, well, there's this new movie called Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. <laughs> and <laughs> so I asked myself, if these guys aren't that concerned about it, why should I be? It, it, uh, I was almost more uh, obsessed with historical accuracy than the historians were, it seemed like. Uh, I'm sorry, this microphone is a little... What, what do I do? Yeah, there it goes, okay. Can you hear me okay? It's kind of moving. Uh, so whether historical accuracy necessarily makes a book or a movie better is kind of a complex question. Jim Crisp, when he invited me uh, to give this talk, uh, he asked me uh, for a title, and I forgot to give him one. And he thoughtfully provided one. <laughs> uh, and I saw it in the program. <laughs> it's called The Possibilities and Pitfalls of Fictionalizing the Texas Revolution from the Gates of the Alamo to Texas Rising. Uh, but if you don't mind, I'd like to back up a few decades and start a little earlier uh, in 1960 and talk for a few minutes about the John Wayne version of the Alamo, which to me is a movie that exemplifies both those pitfalls and all those possibilities. And the pitfalls to anyone who has studied the Texas Revolution are obvious. This movie isn't particularly concerned with getting the history right, as Frank mentioned. Uh, we've got Jim Bowie's multi-barreled blunderbuss. We've got Sam Houston telling the troops, uh, his troops that the Alamo is on the banks of the Rio Grande. We've got the final assault taking place in broad daylight. The movie gets big and small things wrong in ways that for this audience it would just be tedious to, to go through. You know what they are. But when I think of, of what it somehow got right, this movie, I think of an afternoon I spent a few years ago uh, after American History Magazine asked me to go to Switzerland to this town on the shores of Lake Vene Geneva uh, to meet uh, Phil Collins. There we are in his basement. And I spent a couple days uh, going through Phil Collins' amazing collection of Alamo documents and artifacts and weapons and uniforms. And my mission, a my assignment, was to try to figure out in the world why a British rock star uh, would, would have amassed the world's largest collection of private a large, world's largest private collection of Alamo artifacts. And before we toured his museum, Phil and I and his dog, whose name is Travis, uh, <laughs> spent a 
couple of hours in his living room watching the Alamo on TV, the John Wayne Alamo. And of course, we both knew every scene and almost every line of dialogue from memory since we had both geekily watched this movie almost all our lives. But there was something in particular Phil wanted to point out, and it was the big act two turning point. This is the scene, of course, the, the line, ver, John Wayne's version of the line in the sand when Lawrence Harvey playing Travis tells the garrison that all hope is lost and that he'll stay and fight and the rest of them are free to go. And Richard Widmark playing Bowie reacts by dismounting from his horse and he walks over toward Travis. And while he was doing this, Phil Collins was keep saying, hold on, hold on, here it comes, we're about to see it. And uh, Bowie stands next to Travis. Travis turns to him and Phil said, there's the look, there's the look. <laughs> he was so excited. <laughs> and uh, this is Travis, you know, these guys have been mortal enemies through the first two acts of the movie. And now they're shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye, standing firm, willing to die a glorious death together. And Phil said, look at that, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Uh, I'm a couple years older than Phil, and I, I was already under the Alamo's strange spell as a kid by the time the John Wayne version of the movie came out. Here's a photo of my older brother Jim and I at the Alamo Cenotaph in 1955. Uh, if you, it's, a, it's hard to make it out, but if you look closely, we're both not just wearing Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier t-shirts, but also shorts uh, with, little, with Davy Crockett embroidered on the, on the pocket there. Uh, years later, when the John Wayne version was released, four years later, uh, I was totally primed. I had, I had been a total Davy Crockett fanatic as a kid. And I was uh, 12 at this time, and my friend Bobby Reyna and I skipped school. And we uh, somehow convinced our mothers to drive us downtown Corpus Christi to the Center Theater to watch, uh, watch the Alamo uh, the day it opened. Little did we know that school was going to be let out in a couple days, and all, everyone in Corpus could go watch the movie. Um, Bill Collins, when he saw this movie, was nine or ten years old, and he was living in, in the town of Hounslow in Middlesex outside of London. And he, he went with some friends to see it, but he was the only one who said, he says, who was converted. Uh, seeing this movie was really a major event in his life. But he was a kind of lonely Alamo fanatic. He told me it was my secret. Uh, the United States was flooded, of course, with Alamo merchandise, you know, tie-in products and all that stuff, but that wasn't the case in the UK. And to get a coonskin cap, uh, Phil's grandmother had to cut up her old fur coat and sew it for him. <laughs> he, he didn't see the real Alamo until 1973 when he was on tour with Genesis. They were on their first American tour and they were so excited to be in America that they, they had like a three, three days off and they just drove madly through the entire country. And one of the stops was San Antonio. And Phil says he remembers driving west on Houston Street and turning south on Alamo Plaza. And all of a sudden, there it was. This is the place he had been dreaming about all his life. He said, he told me it was so stirring and emotional, it was like meeting the Beatles. And I, I remember thinking as I was flying home from Switzerland, Switzerland after watching the Alamo in Phil Collins' living room, how strange and wonderful it was that this movie had been so life-changing to, to two kids who, who lived an ocean apart. I mean, I lived in Texas, so the appeal of the story of the Alamo was no surprise to me. It was the cultural air I breathed. But for Phil, it, this movie would have had to strike a more universal chord to inspire a, a boy in England. And though the Alamo was all over the place, historically and dramatically, it was nevertheless rousingly coherent as a story of romantic martyrdom and heroic resistance. John Wayne's movie, 
1960 started, Phil Collins on a truly improbable parallel career uh, as a collector of, of historical material about the Texas Revolution. For me, it also had a life-changing effect. It started me on the path to becoming a writer. The first grown-up book I ever read was Lon Tinkle's uh, 13 Days to Glory. And I, I read it in a, from a, a, a 35 cent signet paperback, retitled The Alamo, which was the movie tie-in version of the book. I bought it from a revolving rack in the Lamar Park drugstore in Corpus Christi. There was a blurb on the back by J. Frank Doby that to me completely summed up the appeal both of the book and of the movie that had used it as a resource. Doby called it vivid, simple, and stirring. And, and as you can see that this cheap paperback has a cover showing the Alamo under attack by the Mexican army. Um, it's a wildly fanciful image, of course. Uh, the, the Alamo church not only has its famous uh, bedstead, Taco Bell thing, hump, whatever you want to call it, uh, but it's the only building in the mission, and it's like rising like this giant castle from the Texas prairie. At this point, you know, it, I didn't know the difference, but I remember the profound shock I felt a year later uh, when, when I read Walter Lord's A Time to Stand came out, and I, I read that book and came to page 112 which depicted uh, a couple of versions of the uh, Edward Everett sketch made in 1846 showing the Alamo uh, after the battle, not only with its famous latter-day you know, hump parapet gone, but, but just it was a squat ruin with a you know, crumbling, gouged-out roof line. And I must have stared for hours at those two illustrations. I was trying to square it with the iconic Alamo in my mind. My instinct was just to reject this new information. It didn't seem like it be, could be true. The Alamo could not look as a, so radically different from the way I was used to seeing it. But little by little, at the age of 13, I began to absorb the fact that my hallowed preconceptions had nothing whatsoever to do with authentic history. And that inconsistency be, between what I thought was true and what history told me was true had something to do with the desire I developed that same year when I was 13 to one day write a novel about the Alamo. It took me a long time, about 30 years, to get around to it. But from the beginning, the very beginning, I had a firm idea of what I wanted this book to be. I wanted it to be a, a deeply involving personal story from which the reader could emerge with a sense of not having been sold a bill of goods. The history would be as real as I could make it, and it would reflect that sort of jarring reaction I had when I encountered that, that image of, of the real Alamo church. And I'd hope that th there would be a sort of jarring reaction, a productive jarring reaction on the part of the reader as well. It took me eight years to write the book. A lot of that time was spent in research. A lot of it was trying to figure out how do I tell a story, as Jim mentioned, how do I tell a story where everyone knows the end of it? Uh, my, my solution to that was to try to create characters, some of whom at least could survive the Battle of the Alamo and go on to the Battle of San Jacinto so that I could pull the reader through you know, this catharsis at the heart of the book and, and let, let us see where, how the story ended. Uh, I tried as hard as I could to find the right balance of history in fiction, something that I could, I could live with. Uh, a lot of the people in this room, a lot of the historians here were crucial to me in trying to come to an understanding of, of what this novel, what, what the historical background of the novel could be, how I could write it credibly in a way that they would not sneer at it. Um, I made some mistakes in the book. Uh, I had a Spanish phrase or two wrong, which I've since corrected in subsequent editions. I think some of my critics might have been right in uh, thinking my depiction of Sam Houston was a little harsh. Uh, these mistakes keep me up at night still. <laughs> and uh, every time I write a book and I get the slightest fact wrong, it, it, haunts, it haunts my dreams. And sometimes I can't even look at the cover of the book. I'm so, so concerned. 
But these are my mistakes. These were my mistakes to make. I was in charge, uh, and these were all my responsibility. When you're writing a novel, that's what you do. You're the, you make all the decisions. You decide how historically accurate it's going to be. That's not necessarily the case with movies. Uh, I've been a screenwriter for much of my career, uh, and I've learned one thing, that unless historical accuracy is an agreed upon, urgent priority from everyone in the pro involved in the production, it's just not likely to happen. And there are reasons for this. A director might have a vision for the look and the feel of the movie that, that in his or her opinion, transcends mere history. A producer or a network or a studio might feel that historical reality just, just flat gets in the way of drama. Or more likely, there's just not enough of a budget for anybody to care. It's very time consuming to do the kind of in-depth historical research and, and, and everything needed to make, a, to make the, the movie feel right. Uh, and in these cases, very often, a writer, a screenwriter, who is very relatively low in the pecking order, somebody like that who insists on historical accuracy can be regarded as an eccentric or even an irritant. Most of the movies I, I wrote in my career and that were made have been TV movies. Back in the day, before the golden age of television, uh, when we when there were a lot of movies of the week on ABC and NBC and all the networks and all the, all the cable companies. And these movies were dependent on familiar tropes. They had seven or eight act breaks usually. Act was a, uh, it was a name they came up with to, mean, to, to, to represent a commercial. And it was really important to hit your mark in terms of where those act breaks came because you didn't want to lose the audience. So there was this, there were these viewer expectations, or more precisely, the, the network's expectations of what those viewer expectations are that often kept you from uh, really getting deep into the historical material of the book, uh, of the movie. I, I, I made a, there were a number of historically based movies that I wrote or co-wrote over the years. Oh wait, that's, well, that's the case of the album, you've seen that. Uh, this one is called King of Texas. It was for uh, TNT with Patrick Stewart, Marcia Gay Harden, Roy Scheider. It was originally going to star Gregory Peck, and we met with Gregory Peck uh, in his house to discuss it, but he was sort of aging out of the role. He was about 83 or 84 then. It's hard for him to ride a horse. So Patrick Stewart ended up playing uh, this character, John Lear, who's based on Shakespeare's King Lear. And, uh, there's Marcia Gay Harden and uh, two other actresses, his name, I'm sorry, I've forgotten, who, who played uh, the, the two other Lear daughters. And this was set in 1842 after the Texas Revolution, during the time when the, uh, you know, when, when the Mexicans were trying to recapture Texas. And, you know, the, I had set it more or less around the Battle of Salado. It didn't quite work out that way. Another movie I wrote is called The Last of His Tribe with John Voight and Graham Greene. Uh, this was about Ishi, the supposedly last wild Indian in North America, who was a member of the Yahi tribe, the last surviving uh, member of his tribe after they'd all been wiped out, who ended up uh, working as a janitor in the San, San Francisco Museum of Anthropology. Another one was uh, Beyond the Prairie, the true story of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Not all that true, uh, but I... <laughs> I didn't, I didn't title, I didn't, I, the, the title was mine, but not the subtitle. Uh, another one was The Cult, uh, and this was, took place, this was on the Hallmark Channel, it took place, it was based on a Mikhail Sholokhov short story about the Russian Revolution. They asked me to, to make it into a Civil War movie, and so I said, sure, and I said it during the Battle of the Wilderness. Uh, my... The biggest budget, but my least favorite, is <laughs> Cleopatra, which I hope none of you saw, but I'm afraid many people did. Uh, well, this one was a problem. Uh, I was, uh, I spent four months, four weeks in uh, 
Morocco and uh, in London with the director before I found out that they had hired another writer. Uh, and so it, the final product was was really uh, sexy, I guess. <laughs> it was more like a, a, a you know music video. But I spent a lot of time, uh, obsessive time, as I always do, for instance, researching a uh, Roman battle scene that was going to take place where uh, you know I had the I had to figure out where what's the difference between a maniple and a cohort and what's a augment quadratum and where the cavalry was stationed on the flank and who was protecting the baggage train and uh, you know Timothy Dalton uh, played Caesar and uh, I remember watching this movie and the battle scene was basically Caesar saying charge and uh, this thunderous you know, in undifferentiated horde of, of, of cavalry and Roman legionnaires and, and chariots all descended on the enemy. And it was all my research just went out the window. Uh, another movie I wrote, this one, this is really hard to find and actually hard to find a good image of. It's called Smoke, In the Line of Duty, Smoke Jumpers. And it was about, I, I was asked to rewrite this from a script that didn't work. And it was about the, uh, uh, the uh, Storm King Mountain Fire in 1994, where uh, 14 smoke jumpers died, and uh, I went to to the notes meeting with the network, and was wondering what they were going to say about the movie, about my script, uh, and I got one note from the producer, from the executive, and her note was, "Can the smoke jumpers take their shirts off more?" <laughs> so <laughs> that was. <laughs> That was kind of the level of, of historical accuracy we were striving for. <laughs> I, I don't want to give the impression that I alone was the unheeded voice of historical conscience in these movies. I was getting a paycheck. I was going along with, the, with everybody else. There was a rush to get the movie made. I, I, knew, what, I knew what I was doing. I mean, I was, I was getting paid for my sins. Uh, and so I'm as responsible for anybody involved about whenever it, we're talking about historical inaccuracy. But I, I'd like to think if I'd been in charge of these movies, that they would have turned out differently. I, I wasn't. I was a writer for hire. And it's, it's interesting that in all the, in my whole career as a writer of mo television movies, I, I spent many, many dozens, if not hundreds of hours in, in script meetings, in production meetings, uh, being bombarded with suggestions, with notes, with complaints. Not once did anyone ever challenge me to make the script more historically accurate. It was always about something else. It was about you know, you know, quickening the pace or getting so-and-so on screen more. But my experience, though, is not universally true. And sometimes the right director and the right producers understand that historical accuracy isn't a hindrance to quality movie, but the, the bedrock on which it exists. Uh, Ron Howard planned to set a very high bar for authenticity in his film about the Alamo. Uh, I, I just, I don't remember signing a non-disclosure agreement about this meeting, as uh, I think Jim or Frank mentioned, and if so, I, I may need to retain Stormy Daniels' lawyer. But anyway, a, a group of us were, uh, were, were asked to meet with, with Ron Howard in, in uh, 2002 and, 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 and with Michael Kornbleth and, and some of the other and people involved with the movie to discuss exactly what the Alam this Alamo movie should be about. Uh, it was an eight-hour meeting, I recall. Isn't that right, Jim and Steve and everybody? It's, it was like it went on all day long. And poor Ron Howard was just being bombarded with opinions. And I wonder if that was, had something to do with his decision not to make the movie and to, uh, and to clear the way for uh, John Lee Hancock to, to direct it. Uh, John had the excellent sense to retain Michael as the production designer and, uh, and, and to hire Steve Harden and, and Alan Huffines as historical consultants. I mean, that, he kept that bar way, way high for historical accuracy. 
And I remember when I first saw, whoops, yeah, Michael said, well, this is the picture of the set, and this is the best I could find on the internet, sorry. Uh, but, you know, here's a, a fairly good glimpse of the, uh, of the interior of the set. But I, I, here's a, an image of the, of the church. And I remember Michael took me to see the, to see the set, and it was, uh, well, it was like Phil Collins meeting the Beatles. <laughs> and it was so fascinating to me after, it's a magnificent piece of art, I think. Uh, and after spending eight years in trying to imagine what the Alamo was really like and what it would have been like to be in that place while I was writing my book, and then to stand there was like walking into my own daydream. And Michael, it, it was interesting talking to Michael that day because he was a little bit, he sounded almost apologetic because you had had, you had, had moved the church up a little closer, uh, to aligning a, a little closer along those lo the long barracks, and the reason for that was to so that it could the church could be viewed from pretty much any any angle when you were having a major scene because this was the kind of the iconic image of the Alamo, and Michael I, I, I could tell he had wrestled with this decision, with this you know this excruciating deliberative. Uh, you know, wrangling with this fictional distortion in the same way that I had been doing it when I was writing my, my book about the Alamo. It was, it, it was conscientious. It was, it was, you know, it was deliberate, it was informed, and I, I, I was really impressed, not just with the set, but with everyone involved who had, who had decided that this was going to be a monument to historical accuracy. Uh, then Texas Rising came out, and on the History Channel, no less. And the fact that it had no compelling interest in history, or seemed to, didn't turn out to be a mystery to me because I had been involved. I'd written movies like this. Uh, it, it struck me the movie struck me more or less as business as usual for, for a big, giant, you know, miniseries, kind of like the Cleopatra movie I was involved in. But I have to say, this one was kind of a heartbreaker, because how often in our brief lives are we going to get the opportunity to see a big-budget, ten-part miniseries that covers the Alamo, the Goliad Massacre, and San Jacinto? Uh, it, it was sad to me that it was almost joyously untethered to historical accuracy. I was asked to review, to review the first four hours of, for Texas Monthly, and, and then after I reviewed it, Jim Donovan, who wrote uh, the Alamo book, The Blood of Heroes, we commented back and forth on the magazine's website. Uh, we tried to be open-minded, and we did find some good things to say about it. Uh, but there were some things that I couldn't quite get past. Uh, you can't see it here, but in this scene, superimposed over the, the, the arrival of Santa Ana uh, onto the, at the Alamo after the battle, I thought this was a mistake because I'd seen an early version of it. I'd seen, you know, that was sent to critics. But no, it was on the actual uh, screen movie itself when it premiered. It said March 7th, 1836. And okay, I thought, well, they're trying to, they, for some dramatic reason of their own, they've moved the fall of the Alamo forward a day. But they never explained why they did that. So it seemed to me like just kind of a shrug of indifference to start a movie with the, you know, the most hallowed date in Texas history to have it wrong. And it was probably, there, there were 4.1 million viewers who watched it, not a bad uh, number for these days. And, and uh, maybe it wasn't of great interest to him, to them, but it certainly was to me. I did like uh, Olivier Martinez as, uh, as Santa Ana. This is one of the few depictions of Santa Ana in which he's young and vital and uh, you know, close to his age and uh, looks looks right. Well, he didn't have his mustache there, doesn't he? But he basically looks right for the part. I didn't quite feel the same way about Chris Christopherson as Andrew Jackson. Uh, just doesn't seem right somehow. Uh, here's a 
here is uh, Santa Ana and uh, Emily West, the quote, yellow rose of Texas. And I guess there's an, you know, I would have done this. I would have, if I had had to write this movie, I probably would have put in a love story between Santa Ana and Emily West. I mean, it's, there's a scrap of anecdotal, you know, uh, documentation for that, I guess. Uh, but somehow, I mean, I, I've, I've written a lot of bad dialogue in my life. Uh, I remember maybe the worst was in that Cleopatra movie where uh, uh, there's been this big battle in Alexandria, Egypt, and, and Cleopatra's, uh, Caesar's forces have attacked Alexandria. And the great library of Alexandria, you know, the repository of all the world's wisdom and knowledge has been burned down. It's the most tragic event in cultural history. And afterwards, Caesar and Cleopatra are, are in her chambers and she's dressing uh, Caesar's wounds. And he turns to her and says, sorry about your library. <laughs> so, I'm not, I'm not throwing stones at anybody. <laughs> when I, when I, I have to say that uh, Emily West's line of dialogue to Santa Ana is, is right up there with anything I could write, which is, I want a warm bath with you in it. <laughs> this was right before the Battle of San Jacinto. <laughs> uh, here's the... the uh, the Goliad Massacre, execution. What struck me about this, I'd heard the term circular firing squad, <laughs> but <laughs> I'd never seen it depicted on film. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I just think <laughs> the stage management there might be a little, little wrong. Uh, here is uh, Sam Houston talking to the troops. Now this is, Again, I am, I am complicit in landscape fraud. Uh, and King of Texas, my movie, uh, the King Lear movie that's set in Texas was filmed pretty much where Texas Rising was in Durango, Mexico. Uh, far away, it's a desert landscape here. It's far away from the, from the you know, lush forests and riverine valleys of, in, 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 uh, of revolutionary Texas, particularly during that very wet spring. Uh, and Texas Rising, you, probably, you may remember if you watched all 10 episodes, uh, Sam Houston's tent in Gonzales, which is a very leafy place in real life, was, was perched like a swallow's nest over this precipice, that, you know, this, over this deep chasm. Uh, this is the, the, constant, uh, the constant indifference that Hollywood has to the Texas landscape has begun to ignore me. Not just John Wayne and Monument Valley, or not just uh, the, the fact that the swarm, that movie about the bee attack in Houston uh, back in the 80s, I think, was, began, you know, there's a train that going through a mountain pass and it arrives in Houston. I mean, the, it's just, would Hollywood put up with this? If, what if they had filmed Sunset Boulevard and Sabine Pass? Wouldn't, wouldn't they be a little bit upset? And I think we deserve a little respect from them in terms of the landscape. Uh, but again, I'm not trying to sound superior. Texas Rising is better than some of the historical TV stuff I've written myself. I admit that freely. And it's important to point out that, that somewhere in Texas Rising, somebody really was trying. You could tell. I know for sure that David Marion Wilkinson, my friend who, who wrote uh, the you know, really wonderful novel about the Texas Revolution, Not Between Brothers, he was a co-producer on this, and he did what he could. And there's a lot of evident research in it. Uh, you could, t like in episode three, uh, the, the San Jacinto veteran S.F. Sparks wrote these memoirs or, or recollections. And there's a, you can see the influence of that in the scene where, uh, where this kid, uh, having been told that General Houston is the Army's blacksmith, sort of imperiously orders him to fix his broken pistol. There's much ado about the twin sisters, the two cannons donated to the Texian cause by the citizens of Cincinnati. And there's even a glimpse of Travis's saddlebags, which were captured by the Mexicans at the Alamo. I mean, these, there was a grunt level accumulation of historical detail 
that somebody did, but it kind of feels like it's all gone to waste because the series itself shows every sign that it's proud to be not just historical fiction, but historical fantasy. And, and I know that I'm stuck on the scholarly end of the scale in this debate. I have a low tolerance for wonky costumes and locales and uh, characterizations. But what's interesting about, to me about the reception for Texas Rising is the fact that it wasn't just historians and professional grumps like me who were calling it out for historical inaccuracy, but ordinary <laughs> viewers who it turned out had, did feel like they had an investment in seeing their state and their nation's past portrayed with a reasonable degree of authenticity. The, the History Channel, and I, I say that qualifiedly, <laughs> in, their, uh, in their promos for this, they had the, the line, don't mess with Texas. And, but they did. <laughs> and, and I think they heard about it from viewers. After I reviewed the first three episodes of, of, of the series for Texas Monthly, a, a reader wrote, sent, wrote a, to my website and, and sent me this email that said, I personally think that historical fiction should be banned. It confuses the young and makes old people think they are losing their minds. <laughs> uh, I, I probably wouldn't go quite that far, uh, but I am taking a break from historical fiction. I've, I've moved on, at least temporarily. I, I'm, uh, as, as Jim said, I'm writing a narrative history of Texas. Here's a picture of my desk a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is, this is this, I'm writing this, the history of Texas from roughly Cabeza de Vaca, washing up on the shores of Galveston or Follis Island, whichever it was, in, in 1528, all the way through to Rick Perry on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> and this is what my desk looks like today or, or around now. This is also what my desk looked like when I was writing uh, The Gates of the Alamo or A Friend of Mr. Lincoln or any, any of the other historical fiction I've written, I think uh, it's crucial to, to surround yourself with, with this level of, 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 of material and, and to, to immerse yourself deeply in it. And I continue to be, even though I'm not writing historical fiction at the moment, I continue to be really resistant, steadfastly resistant, to uh, Henry James' plea to Sarah Orne Jewett when she told him that she was working on her historical novel. He, he, he pleaded with her, he said, come back to the present. But she wouldn't and she couldn't and she wrote her book after all despite his advice. James insisted that what he called the old consciousness is out of reach. And we know that, he's right of course, we can't really discover the past and we can't really inhabit it. But we can try and we can't keep ourselves from trying. And the best rule of thumb for that effort, I think, brings us back to, to Hilary Mantel. And she told an interviewer what her technique, what her ethos was in writing historical fiction. And here's what she said. It's really very simple. I make up as little as possible. Thank you very much. We want questions? Yeah, if anyone has a question, I'd be delighted to, to answer, try to answer it. Nobody? Okay, I'm ushering myself off. The, okay. <laughs> For script writing, um, when you approach a script, do you make an effort to use their dialogue, their jargon, uh, their jargon from that time war? Um, uh, what is the best way to, to write historical fiction for a modern audience, is that style so accepted? Yeah, the question is when I'm writing dialogue for a, for, are you talking about for movies or for books or for both? For movies, when I'm writing dialogue for movies from the historical period, do, my, do I make an effort to write dialogue as it, from that period, right? The answer is yes, but it's a qualified yes because we, for instance, we have no recordings of, of the Texas Revolution. So we don't, re we have letters but we don't know, we don't really know how, tech, how people spoke because in the letters they very often don't use contractions. 
Uh, and so there's a kind of, I mean, I, th I think if a movie to me like 12 Years a Slave, uh, which is an otherwise a very good movie, the dialogue felt really, really stiff and, and formal to me because I think it was based on, on uh, you know, documents of the time rather than a kind of intuitive understanding of human speech. So my, my first rule of thumb is I use contractions. Uh, I certainly don't use slang from our time or anything that could approach it. Although there are interesting words like suburbs or the blues which were, which were in use back in the, you know, the 1830s. So you have to be, you know, you, you have to do a lot of research. I found the best way to research period dialogue is to read novels that were written during that time. Uh, not letters so much, but, but, but novels. So if you read Jane Austen, or if you read Charles Dickens, you get a, you get a sense of how the dialogue flows. And it's, 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 you know, it doesn't feel foreign to you. It doesn't feel like something that's been set up. It, it feels natural. And so I, I try to search out uh, you know, what seems to me authentic sounding dialogue from, from, from novels written at that time. The same is true. You know, one of the things about writing historical fiction is you feel like you're uh, you feel like you're sort of obligated to inform the reader about every aspect of the time in, in which you're telling the story. But if you go back to you know read Great Expectations, he doesn't Dickens doesn't tell you give you every detail of every house people walk into or every conveyance they're in. He just assumes that you're all in that already in that world with him and. There's a kind of fine balance, I think, as, an, as a novelist. You have, to, you have to create the illusion that that, that that reader is there with you, and you're not lecturing to the reader or, or showing off your research. Does that answer? Yes, sir. I was fascinated with your quote from Billy Manfield. Where would you find that, her description of how it's impossible to really live history without going to the city? Where would you find that? Uh, I have to. I just googled it. I, I, I there was an interview with her that I that I read. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. He, he he asked where did I find that quote or where would one find the quote from Hillary Mantel about uh, about how how history and how impossible it is to 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 really reconstruct it. Uh, I I I I can't remember exactly. It was from an interview, and I I kind of sliced it out and pasted it somewhere else. But I could try to find it for you if you. Yeah. Yeah, she's really she's unbelievably great at this. I think. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Are we? Uh, yeah. What one back there? If I can make one observation, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the TSHA e-books that we distribute on our website. Since Mr. Harrigan went into so much detail on Texas Rising, you should know that those actually have their roots in Texas Rising because as people were watching the series, they began Googling the characters. Jeff Smith was the number one article research from the Handbook of Texas. Wow. <laughs> people were coming to scholarly resources in the Handbook to learn about these characters to try to match up what they were seeing with, with reality. And we had a very astute staff member who started seeing the traffic just spiking huh. as this thing was airing and said, well, we ought to put these top ones together in an e-book. Going back to accuracy, he wanted to put Emily West in the Alamo version. I was like, no, 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 no. not Emily West in the Alamo, even though Texas Rising did. Um, so those e-books that many of you enjoy were rooted in the craziness of Texas Rising and people looking for answers. So... Uh, I guess, if nothing else, there's a role for TSHA and things like the handbook and people try to dissect movies. By the way, I'd like to give a shout out to the handbook when I'm, I'm writing this, uh, this history, and it's my first stop with almost every, every subject. I, I just go right to the handbook and see what the handbook says, and then I go to the notes, and then I move out from there. So it's just a totally invaluable resource that I, I just cherish. So you guys have done a great job with that. Steve, I have a question. Do you ever agonize when you're writing something like Ace of the Alamo over the debates among historians? Because you've got to pick a way to do it. Yeah. You've got to decide how Davy Crockett died. Right. How do you make those decisions? Well, I do agonize, and I spent 
many, 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 many lunches <laughs> with you and other historians about, for instance, the death of David Crockett. And uh, you, I just, like, to me, I, it comes down to, it comes down finally to history. If I, if all the evidence to me seems to indicate that he, that we don't know how he died, uh, then I have a little leeway in depicting it. Uh, but if the evidence says he, you know, he was captured, if, if I believed all the evidence that says he was captured in the way you do and Paul and other people do, I would have had him being captured at the Alamo. But I kind of, I just weighed it in my own mind and decided, well, I think it probably happened some other way. But it, it was a very tortured uh, decision to make. You know, and, and every, at every moment along the way, I want to make sure that I have a, uh, that I can back it up, back up e any of those. So do you end up using aesthetic as well as historical thinking in doing something like that when you have that leeway? Uh, could everybody hear that question? Do, do you end up using aesthetic as well as historical thinking when you're, creating a scene where you know, uh, you know, the history is on the line more or less. Yes, of course, I mean, aesthetic, aesthetic reasoning is, or aesthetic, you know, creativity or whatever you want to call it is, is I mean, it's fundamental, I'm a novelist, that's what I do. But I, I don't want the reader to waste his or her time reading this book. I don't want, uh, or any book I write, I don't want the reader to feel at the end of the book Oh, he didn't. He didn't play fair. He didn't. He didn't tell the story that in a way that was historically accurate. So whatever aesthetic uh, massaging I bring to a to a particular scene is is predicated upon the historical record. It's not in never in violation of it. And so uh, yeah, I just do the best I can that way. Any one last question for Steve? Right here. Yeah. Uh, yes, I will. I'm going to have to get my notes out. The, the first one? Uh, he was asking me to, to repeat a quote from Hillary Mantel. Uh, and she, okay, here's what she says. History is what's left in the sieve, S-I-E-V-E, -E, when the centuries have run through it. A few stones, scraps of writing, scraps of cloth. It is no more, quote, the past than a birth certificate is a birth, or a script is a performance, or a map is a journey. It's no more than the best we can do. And I can, I can get you a better version of that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Sometimes this combination of education and entertainment that I mentioned a couple of times earlier is very gratifying for the historian who finds his or her work caught up in this process. If you'll indulge me for about a minute, it happened to me on a Sunday morning at the Alamo when they were about to stage a very small version of the siege and capture of the Alamo they had the Mexican soldiers lined up on the left and the Texan soldiers lined up on the right. And I'd actually met some of these soldiers at a pizza party the night before. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, as I was sort of standing in the audience, this Texan soldier leans out and says, Dr. Crisp, will you sign a copy of your article for me? And at that moment, a Mexican soldier leans out. He says, is that Dr. Crisp? Will you sign a copy of your article for me? That's one of those highlights of my life, you know, when I can unite both sides. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't prevent the fight, but at least I had them on the, the same page, as it were. Um, we're going to uh, take a programmed break uh, of about 15 minutes. Uh, please be back promptly uh, at 11.30 to hear one of those foxes that we invited who knows so much about so many things. And I will introduce that wonderful person 
when you return. Thank you.